Poor, poor Odysseus. Life is very hard for him. He's already been blown off course. Days and days of storms. He's already faced the man-eating Cyclops and lost several of his comrades to that gruesome fate. And now he must face what is perhaps his most painful trial yet. He's going to have to go to bed with a beautiful goddess. Thoughts and prayers during this difficult time. Okay, things are about to get freaky. If they weren't already, if the land of the Cyclops and the man-eating monsters who live outside of society were not high octane and weird enough for you, it's about to get even weirder. We are visiting Circe on the island of Ea, a word that even classicists have a hard time saying. It's A E A E A, Ea or Aea. And that's where the goddess, the witch Circe, lives. One of the most famous episodes in the Odyssey. It takes up a significant chunk, probably the bulk of Book 10. And I was kind of kidding. Obviously, it's a little rich that Odysseus now has to face the terrible trial of a beautiful woman that wants to sleep with him. But. There is an element of reality to that because this is also one of the paths not taken. Remember last week I suggested that each of these episodes in the story of Odysseus' journeys, now that we're in the main portion of the tale, each of these episodes you can kind of think of as a path not taken for Odysseus. He's a veteran. He's coming home from war. He has lost his identity in some very profound sense, both because he's no longer embedded into the network of relationships with other warrior heroes that he was previously in. He used to be in a council of his peers among the different Greek fighters. Now he's the sole lone leader at the head of a band of men. And so he's in this isolation. He's lost. He doesn't know how to find his way back home exactly now that he's been blown off course. And he doesn't know how to find his way back into human civilization in peacetime. And this journey that he's on, which really takes off with the Cyclops and with this famous and very profound allegory where he has to pretend to be nobody and then reclaim his identity, is the story of all the different ways that a man coming home from war might peel off and fail to reintegrate into society. So there's a story about man's role in civilization and the costs, the things you have to trade in to live in a human civilization, to be embedded in a network of love relationships and family relationships. And it's about the cost that women pay in the person of Penelope, but also the cost that men pay in the main character of Odysseus. And now we're coming up, previously, last time with the Cyclops, We looked at the civilizational costs, the costs of being politically involved, that you have to do all of the messy debating and annoying arguing that it takes to build a civilization if you want to live in a society and not just in a vague, loose group of random people that don't really care about you. So there's costs to doing politics. You have to involve yourself in annoying disputes in order to build a civilization. Now we're going to look, and I hope fairly straightforwardly, at the sexual and romantic costs of forming a family. What men and women each give up when they commit to one another and to raising children. And that is another one of the core building blocks of civilization that Odysseus has to be confronted with. And the question of fidelity, of who's going to stay true to whom, and are we going to keep this family together when we could easily just go off and sleep around, is very much in the forefront of this poem. And it's been ambient, sort of floating in the atmosphere the whole time, because the context of the journey itself is an act of infidelity. That's true for both the Iliad and the Odyssey, actually. They are both, in some profound sense, about fidelity and what happens when marital relations break down. In the Iliad, you have a war that started over a woman cheating, running away with another man. And there's a question whether she's to blame, whether he's to blame, but whatever it is, this deep fundamental breakdown in the relationship of the royal household requires, cries out for vengeance, not simply because of the grievance on Menelaus' part that his wife's been taken away from him, 
but because of the social structure that that represents. Because if his wife can be taken away, then anybody's wife taking, is, can be taken away. And so the loss of the king's wife poses a threat to the whole established order in a similar way to the fact that the loss of Achilles' war prize poses a threat to the honor culture that makes it worth going out to fight at all. Now, Odysseus has to deal with the fallout of that war, and we see Helen. Remember, Telemachus visited Menelaus and Helen in Sparta when he was looking to try and find news of his father. So we still have that in the background. We have this negative example in the background of Helen and her infidelity and the social chaos, disaster, cataclysm that that caused, we also have the faint hint and suggestion in the background of other negative examples. Remember I talked about Clytemnestra and Aegisthus and Agamemnon coming home to find that his home has fallen apart, and there's different versions of the story, but certainly in the later tragic version that we get from Aeschylus, Clytemnestra is another great example of the anti-heroine. She's everything that Penelope isn't. She's unfaithful, she's resentful, and she's murderous. She kills him. She usurps his position and, and kills him. She's got her reasons for it, but she also, obviously because it's a tragedy, she's there to be part of a breakdown in relations. On the other side of that, in the flip side, you have Penelope, whom we've already met in this poem and who is one of the famous depictions of female loyalty, of, of wifely, womanly grace and, and patience in all of world literature. She's the one who stays home at her loom while Odysseus is at his prow, and the two of them have this joint image where he's standing at the prow of the ship, trying, trying to get home, standing at his mast, trying to make his way back to her, and she's at her loom, and they're in this kind of cinematic overlay, if you can picture them kind of fading different, the, the two of them fading into one another in the, in the movie. That's kind of the image we get from this poem, that this is a picture of devotion, marital devotion. But there's a wrinkle that is very difficult for us moderns to deal with. Those of us who live in the modern world, the world shaped by Christian ethics, the world shaped also, though to lesser degree, by the sexual revolution, and by everything that has happened since the ancient world, it's very difficult for us to wrap our heads around what fidelity looks like on Odysseus' part versus on Penelope's part. Because Penelope is a picture of of marital faithfulness even now to us. She's still a very beautiful image that she won't marry even when she's hoping against all hope, even when it seems like all hope is lost. She won't settle down with one of these suitors despite the fact that they have a decent claim to filling in Odysseus' position, some of them. But she still won't because she loves him so dearly and deeply that she's going to stand at her post while he stands at his. That part is very, fairly easy for us to handle and grapple with. The Odysseus part is harder for us to wrap our heads around because Odysseus does end up sleeping with other women. And yet still, in some sense, we are supposed, I think, to understand this as a story of his devotion. And it's hard for us to wrap our heads around the idea that fidelity might look different for men and than for women. And before we even get into the question of judging this, before we even say whether we think the ancient way of doing things is right or wrong, we have to understand what it is that we are looking at. Because we've talked very briefly, I touched on Calypso, who is the nymph with whom Odysseus spends seven years of his time. We're also now going to talk about Circe, and things get real confusing and disorienting as she starts to turn his men into swine. So there's definitely a suggestion that there's danger, sexual danger here, that Odysseus is in danger of being bewitched, of forgetting his homeland like he might have among the Lotus Eaters, not this time out of avoidance of pain, but now out of desire and pleasure. She seems, Circe seems to have the power to, to reveal men's bestial nature, their raw physical impulses, and the symbolism here isn't really that hard to interpret. You've got a beautiful woman who waylays men on their way home and turns them into swine. That's what lust can do to you, make you just a raw force of animal desire. And Odysseus doesn't meet that fate. He manages to avoid being turned into a swine with the help of Hermes, but he does sleep with 
Circe. So what the heck is going on here? Well, I want to say a few things at the outset just to set the stage, and then we can talk about how Christianity has changed things since Odysseus Day and why that's a good thing, I think. But first of all, let's just think for a second about fidelity in the ancient world, because there is a double standard. And that term gets thrown around a lot lately, and mostly now it means something like, oh, you're you say you're an egalitarian, but really you have this secret prejudice that you're taking out on women or minorities or whatever. But in its most basic form, the phrase double standard just means there are two sets of rules for two sets of people. And in this case, in in the ancient world, men and women are categorically two different sets of people. I know this is very shocking for us to think about, but it's true. They have different roles, different biology, different relationships to one another. They are, in some sense, the only two real categories that everywhere and always are are different. Now, this is still true. Men and women are still different. But we have a lot of technology that enables us to pretend if we want to like men and women are the same and very importantly a lot of that technology is birth control related once the pill comes along once people are able to have sex and prevent by and large pregnancy the rules of the game meaningfully change it doesn't even mean that the morality the sort of absolute moral imperatives change, but it means that the possibilities change and therefore the day-to-day ethics of the thing and the ethical calculation you're making in any given circumstance, the stakes become different. And this is such a profound shift that we all live in the wake of. Whatever your sexual ethics is, you live in the wake of this transformation in human technology, which has been a transformation in the stakes of human sexual ethics. It's really hard for us to think our way out of that. But imagine, if you can, a situation where not only does sleeping, do men and women who sleep together always incur a risk of pregnancy or the possibility of pregnancy if they're of childbearing age and so on and so forth, but children are an economic unit as much as anything else. They are, first of all, a resource drain they are they require taking care of in order for civilization to flourish and to grow you have to feed them and raise them and so forth and then they can be wealth if you have the proper structure set in place if you're let's say you're running a farm on an island somewhere in archaic Greece or Bronze Age Greece or something, and now you've got five sons, they can all help you out, and you can add to the man hours you're able to work. And this is how the ancient oikia, the ancient household, functioned. And it's from that that we get our word economy and economics. So really, what we now think of as this sort of separate sphere of life, that is the economic sphere, is actually family life. Family life and economic life and technology are are closely bound up, and it's only over time that they start to separate out from one another. But at this point, right, the main thing on people's minds is, how do I set my house in order? And in that calculus, again, leaving aside the ethics of it for a second, just thinking about how people are strategizing around these economic questions and how they're managing an ordered society, which remember is Odysseus' goal, is to reintegrate himself into society and civilization, it's actually in both men's interests and women's interests for women to know who the father of their child is. And think about this from the man's perspective first, right? If if a man produces a child and then there's going to be a social expectation that he take care of that child, he wants to know he's taking care of his child, that is, someone who is then going to grow up and take his place when when he's too old to work, help him with his labor. So there's a trade-off going on there, a deal being made. I take care of you, and then you help me around the house. You help build my economic station and setup. So it matters that the woman be faithful so that he can know that kids are his, that he's taken care of, and they're going to be loyal to him, and they're not going to usurp him, and so on and so forth. He can't know that if the woman is sleeping around or if there's some guy sneaking in the back door. She, the woman, is going to 
want the man around to take care of the kid because she's going to be stuck with the kid one way or another. The man can sleep around and leave. And this is the, this is, you talk about male privilege. This is the really like ugly version of that is that men aren't physically attached. There's an unfairness inherent in this. Men aren't physically attached to the kids that they produce. A woman Again, in the ancient world where there's no alternative technologies available to deal with this in some other way, the woman, right, is literally growing this kid in her, in her body and is therefore going to be stuck with the kid. And so if she has, if sleeping with all these random guys, then they're going to have less reason to stick around and take care of the kid for her too. But she's going to be left picking up the pieces. And so for both men and women, female chastity, female fidelity becomes really important. And women are often the ones who police these chastity rules because it's, again, in their interest for her to be the, the father of the child that sticks around. Otherwise, if men think they can just get away with sleeping with a bunch of different women and not being tied down and connected to the woman that they sleep with, then the, you know, the women allow men to do that. Of course, they're going to do it because the, the stakes for them are so distant and they just want to, you know, get sexual satisfaction. So it's women who have to enforce these rules a lot of the time. The male side of this equation in, in its own isolation, is less high stakes. Now, that doesn't mean that men don't cause disaster when they sleep around and they produce children that they're not willing to take care of. But it's up to, in some sense, the women, again, not saying whether that's fair or not, but the women are the ones who have to demand that they stick around. They have to guard their own chastity because if they don't, the men are just going to take whatever they want. The men are just going to let their worst, Im worst impulses loose. And this is part of the image of the men turning into pigs in Circe's magic hut or, or home is that they are, that, that's kind of what's growling under the surface of the male sexual libido is this bestial animal desire. And the woman has to impose a certain degree of fidelity, order, or organization on that. If she allows it, he's just going to sleep around. So there is in the ancient world, there are, I should say in the ancient world, a number of norms and laws and practices that reflect this imbalance. And it's, only in the wake of the Christian revolution that people en masse start to suggest that there's actually a reason for both men and women to be chaste that doesn't have to do with these material concerns, that is spiritual, that has to do with the virtues of fidelity at a purely non-physical level, which is to say that God is faithful to us and so we should be faithful to one another because we are in the image of God. And that is the most profound sexual revolution that ever happened. And leaving aside the sexual revolution that happened in the 60s and 70s, the Christian sexual revolution, which transformed marriage and child rearing and sleeping around or not sleeping around, fidelity from these primarily economic questions that admitted of possible imbalances and unfairness, into spiritual questions where everybody was in some sense equal as a human being created in God's image. That is the most profound sexual revolution that has ever happened or will ever happen. And even we in our degraded age can't wrap our heads around how utterly we have been shaped by this moral outlook. So, as I suggested or indicated at the beginning, that moral outlook is the one that I share. I think we all basically share that moral outlook, that it's not simply a matter of whether you can get, what you can get away with, how you can properly build a household or society in pragmatic terms, but also a matter of morals and in the universal sense of we are made in the image of God and we should be faithful to one another, we should keep our promises to each other. But in the world of the Odyssey, that's not the case. And so Odysseus can be seen as faithful that is, he's devoted ultimately to getting back to Penelope, to taking care of her kids, to managing that household, while he is also sleeping around with these goddesses who don't really, to whom the rules of child rearing don't really apply. It takes place in this kind of magical other world. And his sexual satisfaction that he gains with them is less important than the fact that at the end of his encounters with them, he always ends up asking to leave. He wants to get back. That's his version of fidelity in this world. So, that's the table we have to set for ourselves as we approach these stories and try to understand them and think through because it enables us to grapple with our own sexual ethics and ask 
why we believe what we believe. It doesn't just fall out of the sky that we have this vision that men and women should be faithful to each other. Even well-meaning and virtuous people in the past have had different views of things because they have had different systems of first principles and, and first values. This is a story of fidelity, but it's a story of fidelity in which male f fidelity and female fidelity look different from one another. And so we have to understand that as we follow Odysseus away from the island of the Cyclops. Remember, we left him in the island of the Cyclops, just pulling away from the island of the Cyclops, having incurred the wrath of Poseidon, which is a major no, no, a big party foul. He didn't want to do that because it turns out that now he's going to wander and wander, even though ultimately he is going to get home. There's this suggestion that he may well be destined to get home, but even so, Poseidon is devoted to making it as difficult as possible for him. And I talked last time about how that might be a necessary element of Odysseus' journey because in addition to being a physical traveling journey throughout regions of space. It is also a spiritual journey from the conditions of wartime to the realities of, of home and the trade-offs of home. And now he's confronted with another path not taken, another trade-off that has to do with fidelity. He's going to leave the bed of these wonderful goddesses, these beautiful goddesses, and give up even eternal youth, even their incredibly smoking hot bods and all that. He's going to give all that up and turn aside from that for them, but he has to first be confronted with the trial in order to know that he chooses that definitely over all the other options that a man has of running around, running, running away and sleeping around. So in that respect, it actually is very much a story of Odysseus kind of honor and, and faithfulness to Penelope, but he's first confronted with these, these other options. So there are a couple other stops that I'm just going to touch upon along the way from the land of the Cyclops to Aeaea and Circe. First is Aeolia, which is a minor but serious and significant episode in which King Aeolus, who is in charge of the winds, receives him with a king's welcome. And Aeolus himself is the king of Aeolia, and he's got a little palace where he has six sons that he's married off to his six daughters. Um, we just, nobody thinks too hard about that. It doesn't, uh, it's a little gross. But yeah, so he's got this like weird incestuous family, but he's basically a good guy and he wants to give Odysseus this bag where all the winds are shut up except the one that's going to blow him home. And he tells his crew, don't open the bag. Whatever you do, you have one job. Don't open the bag. But there emerges a dynamic that is very much at play it, throughout the stories of the aftermath of the Trojan War, which is that you've had the war now, right? You've had the big high-octane battles and everybody has put whatever other differences they had aside in order to win back the honor of the king. But now resentments and suspicions that were lingering under the surface are going to come really to the forefront. So we had in the Iliad, we had, for instance, Achilles saying things like, well, don't other men love their wives? Like, why do we all have to fight for you, Agamemnon and Menelaus? And that suggestion that this might be unfair and that Helen might be <laughs> to blame and maybe we should just leave her and Menelaus and they deserve each other, that was lingering in the background, but it, because of the life or death conflict that was on the table, nobody really stopped to genuinely ponder those things at the level of like revolution. Now, those resentments are going to come back up again. And those suspicions of leadership, whether they really do have the community at, at heart or whether they're just out for their own gain are going to come up. This is a major part of tragedy too. A lot of tragedies take place in the wake of the Trojan War and involve people saying like, why did I have to lose my brother for some random Spartan woman for some for some uh fliberty gibbet some some strumpet from sparta now my brother is dead or something so there's all these things that are now be, being allowed out into the open and that's also part of the fallout the aftermath of war in this case we get a picture of odysseus crew suspecting that this bag of winds is actually a bag of loot that he's keeping from them so he wants the plunder for himself and they don't trust him they open the bag of course they get blown way off course and this is where Odysseus gives us a little moment, a little insight into his psyche, which if you blink, you'll miss it, but it's very important for what comes next. Odysseus considers suicide. And suicide in the ancient world is another thing that 
we don't always understand because the Christian revolution has transformed our way of thinking about this. I actually just watched this movie, Wings of Desire, which is about angels that are watching over the people of Berlin. And it's a very, very poignant and heartbreakingly powerful movie in a lot of ways. But the most moving scene is when an angel is hovering over a man who's about to pitch himself off of a building. And it's represented as this dreadful, almost physically painful sorrow for the angel, that the angel is invested in this unique human soul. And there's much less of that idea in the ancient world. In fact, in the ancient world, there are there is a higher plane. There are gods, there are absolute truths, there are moral imperatives, all the stuff that doesn't just, that makes us more than animals. That all exists in the ancient world. But it's less, much less clear that that sphere, that realm of the divine or the highest principle has a minute interest in you personally, keeping you around and in, in the value of each individual soul. It's another version of the consequences of the Imago Dei that we would have this idea that the angels want every person around. For the ancients, it's much more like, well, these impersonal laws of, of logic and morals, at some point, you know, they might require that I shuffle off the stage. I'm going to die anyway. I, I am not, you know, my existence isn't infinitely important. It has this limited human span. And so why not just, as Marcus Aurelius says, just take control over your exit. The Stoics talk about this a lot. Like, why not just take control at least over your death? Those of you that read or watched Shogun recently will have encountered and grappled with the ancient Japanese or the feudal Japanese version of this, that if honor demands it, you must take control over your own death. Again, this is not something that Christian societies believe, and it's one reason why there is so much argument over things like euthanasia in Christian societies, because we believe that every human life has an infinite story to tell, and that the existence of it is even potentially worth living through suffering. Now, that idea is not absent from the ancient world, as we're about to see. Odysseus actually does decide to suffer, but he also contemplates ending it all. And, and we, should, we should watch this, because it, it's kind of an astonishing little human moment. As always, I'm translating for you here from the Greek. This is book 10. And Odysseus describes the experience of being blown off course and, and getting buffeted by the waves. He says, but as for me, when I came to and woke, I tore at my stalwart heart, debating whether to plunge from the ship and die in the sea's oblivion, or reluctantly live and stay on to endure what the living must face. I endured. I held on and suffered, lying flat in the ship, hiding out from the waves. We're going to get this same idea reworked in Virgil's Aeneid when Aeneas first appears in that epic, the, the Roman epic of the founding of what will become Rome. Aeneas says, I wish I had died in Troy. Why do I have to live on through this pain? And Odysseus is asking himself the same question here. And the answer is because the living is the courageous choice. We get this verb, tolmao, to dare again and again, to endure, to suffer what the living must suffer, when oblivion might be easier. And this is going to become a central part now of Odysseus' identity. He chooses suffering rather than annihilation because life itself and the life that he wants at home with Penelope is worth it for him. And I think there's a precursor here to the Christian impulse that life has an inherent value unto itself, even if life is painful especially because Odysseus chooses that option here when it's not a guarantee, when there are real and, to his community, honorable ways of ending your life. So he's not just faced with the necessity of living. He actually can choose not to live and chooses to live anyway, which ultimately we all do in our moments of deepest crisis. We all have the option, strictly speaking, of, of ending life. But this impulse, the impulse to live even in suffering, to move through because the life itself is worth it, is a really remarkable moment and a moment where the 
ancient pagan ethos kind of lines up with the what will become the Christian ethos when it doesn't have to, when that's not a guarantee. It's not, for example, how Marcus Aurelius seems to have regarded this or Seneca, but it is how Odysseus regards it. And that's a major part of, of who he is, which also will speak to why he goes to all the trouble to go back home, right? So he moves on from this, kind of picks himself up from this perhaps lowest point. Although, I say lowest point, the next step on the journey is the Lystragonians, who are this little terrifying horror movie interlude of giant cannibals, a woman as big as a mountain, and they basically eat most of his men. This is where a lot of the men get taken. They get struck, knocked unconscious with rocks and speared like fish, and it's awful carnage. But it's also just kind of this blip that really brings Odysseus all the way to his, uh, I guess it's probably foolish to try to pick a lowest point, but this is certainly where the journey has unraveled so entirely that Odysseus doesn't even have coordinates, doesn't even know where he is or where he's going. And it's in that moment that the remnant, the last few members of his crew that he has left, end up on Ea, Circe's island. And at that moment, there's a little interlude, a weird moment where some god, they say, sends what I always think of as the the Patronus, which is a stag, this big, beautiful stag, and they instantly kill it and eat it because they need food. They're they're hungry, and they're skittish, and they're traumatized. They're really, at this point, wary of any new experience, as who wouldn't be? They began with a certain degree of confidence and optimism, and then every time they ventured out into some domain, some unexplored domain, they discovered these hostile evildoers, cannibals in many cases, the Lystragonians, the Cyclops, now they have good reason to be frightened of the world, and they still nevertheless have to make that Odysseus choice to move forward and to live and find some way of enduring, of of suffering through the pain for the sake of life itself. So they don't want to go. They don't want to go check out Circe's dwelling on the island, even though that's their only hope of getting food, sustainable food, is to try to find out what sort of form of civilization there might be on this island. Eurylochus, who's one of Odysseus' men, draws the short straw and leads, leads a scouting party of 22 men to figure out who, what kind of people these are, and they end up in Circe's lair, and Circe has pharmaka, which is where we get our word pharmacy, but it's an ancient Greek word meaning something like drugs or charms or spells. It's part of a series of Greek words that we can now translate in a range of different ways because we now have this distinction between science and medicine on the one hand and magic and incantation on the other hand. But in this period of history, a pharmacon is just something that I can give you to eat or put on you or use that will change your constitution. It, maybe it'll drug you to sleep. Maybe it will heal your wound. Maybe it's a, an herb that's actually really good at fighting infection or something. But because the, cause, the underlying causes of those things are, are more obscure, there is this tight connection between witches and good magic and bad magic. And so we're up against a, an evil pharmacon here that's, or a drug that's being used for for, for evil, or at least for seduction and enchantment, because what she does is she drugs them, and then she touches them with her wand, and they all turn into pigs, which is horrifying. She seems to have domesticated a bunch of other animals, or maybe turned a bunch of other people into different animals that are tame. There's like tame lions and wolves around her house, but she has reduced these men to their raw impulses. And like I say, the symbolism here is pretty clear. It's a beautiful woman. They haven't seen a woman that they have the potential of sleeping with for a long time, and she unmans them. They lose their wits, they lose their sensibilities, and they are vulnerable, which reveals an element, a dimension of this male-female dynamic that I started out by talking about, which is that men have a certain kind of power, which is force and physical power and economic power, but women also have a certain kind of power, which is power over men. Men's sexual impulses are a form of power that women have over men, and it's one reason why today online you can see all these people who are suddenly being like, wait, I can not sleep with people. <laughs> like, I can not sleep around. I can control my sexual urges. And that's actually this enormous source of power. We have this ridiculous modern idea that we get in part from the sexual revolution, that the powerful one is always the one sleeping around, always the one indulging his impulses and desires. And that comes, I think, from 
the feminist movement, which wanted women to have the same kind of power as men. And so it was pointing out that, you know, men can just sleep around in a way that women can't because they get saddled with the children. And so we now want to sleep around. We have the technological means now with birth control to do this and whatever. And so now we have this idea that male power is just all about asserting your will, get grabbing what you want, following your impulses. If you listen to Taylor Swift, for instance, and if I was a man, that she would go running around, sleeping around, nobody would ever accuse her of anything. Or Beyonce, if I were a boy, I'd turn off my phone and I'd just, you know, have all the sex that I want. That's the legacy of this silly kind of girl boss feminism that has taught us that that's what male power is. Almost the opposite is true. True male power is self-continence, is, is, is self-control and continence. That when you are able not to act on your impulses, that's when you're really a man and not a beast. But their will, the, the self-control of these men has frayed over time and abstinence and so forth. And they are vulnerable to this power that Circe has over them, represented, embodied by her power to transform them into pigs. So that part is like not that difficult to interpret. The next part is really interesting. Because what happens next is we get our first ever instance of the use of the word nature in literature, in world literature. The Greek word physis, which I've talked about on the show before, is related to the verbs for growing, and it has to do with the natural order of the world. What happens if you spun, if you just leave things to their own devices? What spontaneously happens? If you plant a seed and you let the rain water it and you let the sun shine on it, what eventually happens? You get a flower. That's nature. And Hermes comes to Odysseus to show him the physis, that is the nature of a plant called moly. And this plant will protect him, Hermes says, from the charms of Circe. And that's why it's important that pharmacon means both drug and, and magic, because it, it is a kind of divine intervention that Hermes is offering Odysseus here, and it's an understanding of underlying cause. This plant is the thing that will protect you from that plant. And it doesn't come the way we would expect it to now with a chemical analysis or a stoichiometric sort of assessment of the gases in the air or, or anything like that. It doesn't come with the kind of material components, but it comes with the fundamental basics, the, the sort of primary elements of underlying cause and effect. And that's another huge dimension of Greek thought that's sort of in evidence here and then will be, be picked up by the natural philosophers who sort of invent the process of studying the natural world systematically and trying to nail down, if you do this, then that. It is magic. I mean, the stories of witches and magicians are stories of proto-scientists because they're stories of people who have secret knowledge about the kinds of actions and elements and objects that can cause the certain kinds of effects that gives them power. And Hermes intervenes to grant Odysseus mind, human mortal mind, access to those underlying powers, which is a major role of the gods in the Homeric poems. They sort of represent our capacity to connect to logic, to the logos and the pure ultimate causes of things that exist outside of the merely physical particulars of what's going on. So Hermes unveils fusis that he can use to combat the pharmacon. So it's nature versus drugs, or it's plants versus magic, or whatever. And these two competing forms, or rather using one kind of drug or plant to ward off against another kind of drug or plant. And this is what brings Circe to her knees. So I'm going to read you now a, a pretty significant passage where what happens after Circe tries to enchant Odysseus. So she thinks she's drugged him, but he's got the moly so he can prevent it. And then she tries to turn him into a pig. And instead, so she said, she said the magic words, but I drew the piercing blade from beside my thigh and I rushed straight onward at Circe as if I intended to kill her. But she ran toward me in loud hysterics and grabbed my knees. She wailed as she spoke through her tears and addressed me with words on wings. What kind of man are you then? What fatherland city produced you? The rarity of a man who can ward off these sexual advances. I mean, this story works on so many different levels. It's a story about nature and magic and the use of knowledge and understanding to combat science with science, but it's also an allegory of, of the sexual relations between men and, and women and the different kinds of control and power that they're able to have over one another. That Circe can exert total control over your average guy who doesn't have self-control and can't keep a hold of his impulses. But with Odysseus, who is learning to be circumspect, who's learning to 
bring his impulses under control, she has no power. In fact, she is powerless. And that sorcery, that charm is totally broken because of what he's learning, which is that he's devoted to getting home. So it's that same self-control that's going to enable him ultimately to leave and move on from the island of Iia and make his way slowly, painfully back to his wife who, who loves him. And that level, it's a story of all married men, because all married men must gain sexual self-control so that they can have power over the many temptations that will come, the many options where it would be so easy to sleep around, but they don't, right? What's that about? That's about the magic, the, the power of sexual self-control. So she's flabbergasted by this. She says, what kind of man are you then? What fatherland city produced you? I'm seized with awe that you drank those drugs and remained unenchanted. No one else ever, not one other man, has withstood those drugs. If you've ever seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where Brad Pitt has to turn down this very young, nubile girl, and she's throwing herself at him, that's the kind of power that Pitt has here and that Odysseus has here. Not, and, and it's rare. Not one other man has withstood those drugs. Not once they've passed the barrier, not once they've passed the barrier of his teeth as he drinks. But you have a heart in your chest and a mind that can't be beguiled. Surely you must be Odysseus. This is really important. Anytime Odysseus identifies himself or somebody else identifies him, we're getting another clue into the kind of man he has to become in order to go back home. He has to choose life even when it's painful. He has to commit to the pain because the pain is the cost of, of living. He also has to choose the loss or the resistance to other things that he might desire. A mind in your chest that can't be beguiled. Surely you must be Odysseus, man of the many ways. There's Pelutropos again. His story is spreading around. The story of this poem is getting around. Hermes Golden Staff, Monster Bane, always said you would come on your way up out of Troy, going home in your swift black ship. Now then, put your sword back in its sheath, and then let's us two go to my bed, to our bed, so that there we can blend and entwine and grow to trust one another in sleep and in making love. So she offers him a straightforward now, I'm at your disposal, essentially. And Odysseus is still suspicious because this is effectively the same offer that she's been making at an allegorical level, and he thinks that she's going to get him naked and unman him. So here's what he says. He says, So she said, but I answered her back with the following words, Circe, how can you call on me now to be tender to you when you've turned my companions to swine in these very palace halls where you now propose to detain me, inviting me, plotting deceit, beckoning me to come into your chambers and mount your bed where you'll get me naked and put some sinister plot into cunning action. Oh no, not me. I'd never willingly mount your bed. Never. Unless you'd be willing to offer a solemn oath. So I think this is supposed to be funny. You, you have to sort of tease out jokes in ancient literature because it's never quite clear whether it's meant to be a joke. But I think this is supposed to be funny. <laughs> He's just gone through this enormous trial and of self-mastery. And with the help of the gods, he has overcome this appeal. And we're supposed to think, yes, triumphant moment. Oh, but she's still a goddess. Unless you'd be willing to offer a solemn oath not to do me harm or to lay out some other evil scheme. So he's like, if you have totally submitted to me and you have uh, promised not to try anything else, no more funny business, and then I'll go to bed t with you. And this is where our modern sensibilities just can't go with Odysseus in the same way. We would expect a modern man not to sleep with this te temptress, this seductress, but for him, the danger is now past because he doesn't have the same idea that we have of the sex act in itself being an act of infidelity, but instead can trust that she's not going to try to pin him down in some way, not going to try to saddle him with children or anything like that, but is just offering him this pure act of pleasure that doesn't really constitute the same kind of infidelity that it would if Penelope did it, for instance. And this is, again, this is this double standard that, that they have. Turns out Circe's not so bad once you get her under control. They stay there for a year. So this is like, you know, where I, where I pull out the world's smallest violin for Odysseus. It's like, oh no, the trial of living on this enchanted island with this beautiful witch who wants to sleep with you. Really sad, hard life. 
But he has gone through a major trial. Much as I make light of it, he has just gone through and overcome a very important trial. And he's not the last time he's going to have to do this, but he has done it for the first time in a major way, decided that he is going to have control over his own sexual impulses, which are going to be the, it's going to be ingredient to ultimately making the choice to go back home. But first, there's one other thing that has to happen, which is he has to get closure with what's left of his crew. I find this very, very touching that he's kind of carousing around for a year or so with, with Circe on this beautiful island, and then they come to him and say, we, we got to go home, man. We miss our family. You are maybe yucking it up with Circe, but don't you remember that we have homes? And it's sort of the reverse of what he had to do for them on the, on the Lotus Eaters land in that area. He had to pull them back and from for, for the brink of forgetfulness. Now they kind of pull him back, and they, this trust is reestablishing itself after the breakdown of relations in the wake of the war when they opened the bag and they didn't trust him. Now they're getting sort of back together to understand one another, and, and they're going to stick together, the few of them that remain, for these, these last few adventures. And I wish, I truly wish I could tell you that these guys are all going to get home. But uh, one of the saddest parts of the Odyssey is that Odysseus loses basically all of his companions. But for now, they play this crucial role in getting him, jogging him out of the sort of torpor that he's been in with Circe. And they say, "Ask, ask her to let us go. And this is where we get the most important final reversal, because remember that Circe just grabbed his knees when, when he took control. Now that he's in her arms, he says, but me, I went in to Circe upon her gorgeous bed, and I clutched at her knees, and I pled, and the goddess heard my voice, with which I addressed her, and uttered the following words on wings. O oh, Circe, deliver now on the promise you made. Stand by it and send me homeward. Desire is aching within me to go, as it is as well for my comrades, who are always wearing my fond heart down with grim lamentation whenever you happen to be somewhere else. And there it is. She says, don't stay against your will. It's time. It's time for him to move on because of what he's been through on the island, because of the transformation that he's undergone. Every one of these journeys is a transformation. Everyone is a trade-off. Everyone is letting go of something. And in this case, it's letting go of the impulse that every man feels at some point to just, sleep. what's going to be the harm? Just sleep around, just have whatever sex you want. Well, the answer is it turns you into a swine. So you've got to get a hold of yourself. All right. We've got one more book of real wanderings and adventures to go through, and then we will be closing in on the homeward stretch. I'm still taking suggestions for what poems to do next. I'm really looking forward to another one. I had a suggestion from my dad, Andrew Clavin, no relation, when I went this week to do a live stream at the New Jerusalem, which you should watch, by the way. I'll drop a link to this. We answered questions at thenewjerusalem.substack.com. You can go check that out. I'll put a link in there. Now, this is the part of the show where I usually do a mailbag question. And you can still send me mailbag questions. I will answer them if you send them to me at rejoiceevermore.substack.com. You can DM me or you can write me uh, uh, an email in response to my weekly essays. You'll also get a bunch of content if you sign up there. But I'm going to take a break from the typical mailbag segment this week. And that's because this is the last time I will talk to you on our Tuesday episodes before the release date of my book, Light of the Mind, Light of the World, Illuminating Science Through Faith. So I'm just going to make one more pitch to you for this book, which I really do believe that you will get a lot out of. I wrote it for you. I wrote it almost primarily with young heretics listeners in mind, people who are intellectually curious, people who care about the great traditions of the West, but also want to live in the modern world and don't want to get trapped or caught up in backwards thinking or antiquated notions or they're not you're not superstitious you're not uh, a sort of hidebound traditionalist you're not any of that you just believe in the value of tradition and you know that the world is more than mere matter well we my friends have grown up with a narrative around us that people like us are inherently irrational and anti-science and I wrote this book because I wanted you to see that this idea of the conflict between science and faith is actually outdated scientifically, that the history of science tells a very different story. And so I wrote a history of science from a religious perspective, but with real care for and attention to the science so that you can see how 
Science itself in the West arose out of a religious impulse. It seemed at one point to be veering away from God, but now many of the discoveries of science are actually making it much more possible to believe in God. Science can't prove or disprove the existence of God. That's not what this book is about. But it is about how we can understand science in a way that doesn't just lead us to think of ourselves as chemistry sets inside of meat sacks. So I thought, what I thought I would do, just for you guys, instead of the typical mailbag, as I'm just going to read to you from the opening, the very introduction, give you a little teaser of this book, and I do really hope that you will pre-order it before it comes out next Tuesday. That's a great way to support me, as well as I think you'll like the book. If you would like to really support me, the pre-orders are really important. And word of mouth is really important for making books into a success. And I'm, I'm really hoping this one will be one. So I'll, let me read to you from it, and then I, I hope you'll go pre-order it. So here it is. I got it here. Light of the mind, light of the world. And I'm just going to read the first few pages. The introduction is called From Dark to Dawn. This is a book about how God reveals himself through science and human experience. It is a story about how the natural world once seemed alive with spirit and divine fire, and how it may be starting to seem that way again. For many, the world has come to look dark and dead, like a machine. There are rumors and threats abroad that it will stay that way, that humanity itself will be discarded or surpassed by its own technological creations. It can feel as if religion is on the ebb, as if humanity is a mistake and God is ancient illusion. But this notion has already become outdated, though we haven't yet fully realized it. The argument of this book is that our latest discoveries about the natural world do not make humanity look irrelevant or God seem obsolete. Just the opposite. The world described by science increasingly looks like the world revealed by faith. The lights are coming back on. It's also quite possible that this book will exasperate both scientists and theologians alike. Since I am neither a scientist nor a theologian, and since I may be justly accused by each of meddling in their affairs, I suppose I had better explain myself. Anyone who tries to discern the imprint of God's hand upon the heart of man, and by telling a story about the history of science, no less, is vulnerable to several accusations of extreme presumption. Who are you, scientists may ask, to tell us the meaning of our work? If there are puzzles and contradictions in cosmology, you will not be the one to solve them. If, on our soaring journey to the breathtaking pinnacle of human knowledge, we have kicked up a little dust of confusion and raised a few unanswered questions, you, a classicist, an antiquarian, a scholar of bygone things, will not be the one to answer them. And on one level, this objection is perfectly justified. When our most distant pilgrim telescopes send back freshly glittering depictions of some new cosmic hinterland, you won't hear about it first from me. I am not the person who will resolve the quandaries presented by hoary galaxies standing resolutely in what should be the youngest regions of space we can access, waiting like stately druids with a youthful mischief in their ancient eyes. I have nothing like the mathematical or the experimental expertise it will take to sort out that kind of alarming paradox. But that is not my intention. The point of this book is not to contest or amend any particular scientific discovery. It is to say something about the whole nature and structure of the enterprise, the whole practice of seeking knowledge about the natural world. And that practice has always implicitly assumed a rational structure in nature. The word cosmos in Greek just means order. This was the conviction of the earliest known astronomers and natural philosophers. It was the belief of the Chaldean sky watchers of Babylon, by whose measures we still trace the arc of every circle, and the sages of Miletus who hunted out the principles of matter in the growing and dying of earthly things. To set out in search of laws that govern nature is to insist, often against all appearances to the contrary, that the convoluted muddle of events as we currently experience them is really just one phase of a regular pattern. 
Despite the odds, we remain confident that the waves we can see lapping against the shore of our tiny island betray currents and tremors that extend unseen through all the dark depths of the sea, whose rhythms, though staggeringly intricate and varied, arise ultimately from the interaction of a few simple principles. That is the belief that gave the geographer Eratosthenes the gall to think he could calculate the circumference of the earth in the 3rd century BC, despite the fact that he had never left the vicinity of the Mediterranean. It is the same belief that motivated the discovery of Antarctica, no less than the discovery of the Higgs boson. After all our millennia of voyaging, somewhere in our hearts, we are still certain that the world has an order. Implicit in that certainty is another necessary truth, more often unspoken than not. The human mind is not an accident. It is stamped with a certain inescapable structure that gives order to our perceptions, that funnels them into language and textures them with meaning, that discerns in the physical world a character of harmony. That world does not simply appear to us as a hectic concatenation of unrelated parts, but as an organic whole, freighted with significance, woven through with cause and consequence, shuddering everywhere with tempting whispers of a grander harmony than we can yet discern. It is natural to look at the stars and wonder why they move across our field of vision. But what's remarkable is that we expect such questions to have answers. We may get the answers wrong, but through trial and error, checking one another as we go, we can also get the answers right. We cannot help but feel that the world should be accountable to our logic. Our way of seeing things feels to us like more than an illusion. It feels like a promise. If it didn't, there would be no point in science or in anything else. Unless we expect the universe to deliver on our innate expectation of order, we might as well just close up shop right now. On the other hand, if we are going to carry on asking questions like how do quantum effects relate to gravity, or can a superconductor function at room temperature, then our actions will continue to demonstrate, however we may verbally protest to the contrary, that we believe our minds reveal truths about an ordered world. However human consciousness came about, it seems to those who possess it to be capable of extracting meaning from its surroundings, and that meaning, in order to be valid, must be latent in the whole universe. It must be threaded through the grain of all things, networked and embedded into a coherent whole that takes shape under our scrutiny. Which means the world, in turn, must be more than just debris. Order, meaning, harmony. These are more than physical things. They are things we discern in and through the material world, but they are not themselves objects. And so, if the human mind can truly know anything at all, and we believe it can, then when it reaches out beyond itself, it must encounter more than matter. It must encounter another mind. That is the argument of this book. And to read that argument and to learn the thrilling story of science as it has emerged, as it has grown and developed, and as it is now revealing the world to us, you got to pre-order my book, Light of the Mind, Light of the World, Illuminating Science Through Faith. I really hope you'll do it on Amazon or wherever else you get your books. I really think you'll get a lot out of it, and I would be honored if you would take a read and check it out. It is also available on Kindle, and there will be an audiobook, but not right now for pre-order. It is coming down the pike, so please do pre-order. As always, it is just a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you, to be reading these great works, to be reading the Odyssey, to be contemplating what to do next. Thanks again for being with me. You're why I do what I do. You're why I can do what I do. And it's all for you. So thank you for being here. And I will see you next time for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.